Open your Bibles, if you would, to Exodus, the 21st chapter. We'll be continuing our study today of the goodness and severity of God as we study the book of Exodus. This is Lesson 10. These are the judgments, and we'll be com covering Exodus 21-1 through the end of chapter 23. This can be a difficult section of scripture for some people. It's a long list of regulations, guidelines, a long list of laws and ordinances. And some of these are things that are hard for us to understand in our day and our time. Uh, for instance, I don't know how many of us have seen an ox, let alone an ox that could gore a man to death, or let alone know of someone who had been gored to death by an ox. And yet, there are several verses that talk about this situation in this section. And so like the genealogies that we talked about in the very first lesson, there's a temptation to skip over these and go to them only when we have a particular reference in that area or we want to look up a particular thing. The organizational structure of this section can also cause it to be difficult for us to follow. Because it seems almost as if there's a random list of regulations, of rules that are handed down. But if we spend the time studying this, I think there's a couple things we can benefit from. One is that it'll help us to understand their culture, what they were dealing with at that time. Because all these rules, all these laws, all these judgments are in regards to everyday life that they're going to be living while in the wilderness and when they enter the land. But more importantly, I think it will help us to understand what God's will was for them and perhaps what God's will is for us because behind all these rules, these regulations, these laws, these commandments, is God's moral code. God's desire for how he wanted the people to behave, how he wanted them to treat one another, how he wanted them to treat the nations around them, how he wanted them to acknowledge him as God and to worship him as God. So in seeing God's will, I believe it can help us to understand what God wants from us as we look at the laws and the regulations and the rules that we find written in the New Covenant. And as we study them and think about them as we look at the New Testament. This section begins in chapter 21 and verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. Now your translation may say rules or regulations or ordinances as we've said. We don't know for sure what period of time these three chapters represent. It could have been a few hours. It could be a few days. It could have been several days. And we're not really sure how this revelation came to Moses, whether it was specific instructions which God gave or if it was God's response to questions that Moses might have asked about specific situations. You remember not long ago we studied how he would spend all day judging the people. They would bring their causes to him and he would judge and serve that role. And his father-in-law Jethro encouraged him to do it differently. And he went to the Lord and confirmed that that was good. And so he did it that way. So it may be that these are simply a list of things which he had brought to the Lord and asked how should I rule on these things? We don't know exactly how this was delivered to him other than it came from God to Moses. And this is what they should be taught. And this is what they should be told to do. But we do know this. Even though the organizational structure may be difficult, even though there are things here which we may not see and understand in our society today, we know this is the word of God. And we know it was delivered to them in a fashion which they could understand and they could remember because they would be told to remember this as it was read to them from time to time 
They promised they would follow it as it was read to them from time to time. They were told to teach it to their children and to their grandchildren in a variety of opportunities, day by day, as they were in the field, as they rose up, as they laid down of an evening. They were supposed to teach this to their children. So it was something they needed to remember. So this was delivered to them in a fashion which they could understand and they could remember. And inasmuch as it's difficult for us to to understand or work our way through reading these, we need to realize that that's primarily uh, a result of the difference in our culture, a difference in the time in which we um, live compared to them, and frankly, a difference between the amount of time we spend thinking about these things and the will of God and the amount of time they would have spent thinking about these things and the will of God. This section is often called the Book of Covenant. Most people will say chapters uh, 21, 22, and 23 are the Book of the Covenant. And that's referred to in chapter 24 and verse 7 when we're told that Moses took the Book of Covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. Other people would go back to chapter 22, excuse me, chapter 20, verse 22, just at the end of the Ten Commandments and say, well, that's really where um, the book of the covenant begins. Other people will include the Ten Commandments in this idea of the book of the covenant. I would submit to you that as we look at this idea of the um, book of the covenant, that this is everything that the Lord has told Moses and the people to do all the way up until this point at Sinai. I don't think it's limited just by the Ten Commandments or what's happened since the giving of the Ten Commandments. And I will talk about that in a little bit and why I think that is. But I would also submit to you that while there's a whole host of regulations, laws, rules, whatever word you want to use, in these three chapters, they are primarily built upon the Ten Commandments. They are primarily examples of how to implement the Ten Commandments. Now, there are exceptions to that, but we're going to see, as you read through there, some specific examples in regards to that. And um, uh, that's important for us to think about as we look at these individual laws and we think about them because I believe they are built upon those Ten Commandments and what has been taught before. It's certainly something that was laid out to the children of Israel. It was certainly something that they said that they would be obedient to. And it's something which uh, throughout the history of Israel we can read about. And I'm going to give you one example here as we think about this. And that's the example from the time of Josiah that we can read about in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings 22, if you'll turn over there, we read about the time when the book of the law was recovered. Uh, they had been doing work in the house of the Lord. And in chapter 22 and verse 8, we read where they came and said, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And it says that he read it. And he takes it to the, uh, that scribe takes it to the king and tells to the king what has happened. And in verse 11, and it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And we know why he rent his clothes, because he realized that the children of Israel were not keeping what was in this book of the law. Now, why are we talking about the book of the law here? Well, because in chapter 23, in uh, verse 2, I want to read this, and I want you to listen to what it says here about this book. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord. The book of the law and the book of the covenant are the same thing here. It's referring to the same thing. This is what was found in um, the house of the Lord. 
It's what Josiah realized they weren't doing. And you go on and read in this chapter, you can see that he goes about to reinstitute the things that are taught in this book of the covenant. And one of the things he does is to destroy uh, the worship of the pagan gods, to destroy anything that was a representation of the pagan gods. And this was the reform, as it's called, of Josiah. This was Josiah trying to renew the covenant with God after he realized what was in the book of the covenant. So you see, this idea of the book of the covenant that's given here on Sinai is what we can read about many years later, the children of Israel uh, finding and seeking to follow. Now notice in verse 3 of Kings, uh, 2 Kings 23. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes and all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people stood to the covenant. All the people agreed to stand by the covenant. All the people agreed to keep the covenant. But notice what it's called there. His commandments his testimony, his statutes with all their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant. Sounds a lot like what we talked about last week when we talked about the Lord told the children of Israel to keep the covenant that he was giving to them. Now, as we think about this a little further here in 2 Kings 23, we could read much in this section about this idea of the book of the covenant, but let's turn to verse 21. And we'll read you what it says in verse 21, and this will go back to what I said earlier about what's included in the book of the covenant. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Now, some people believe that what they found was the book of Deuteronomy, and that's possible uh, because many of the things we're reading about here, as we've talked about in previous weeks, are duplicated in the book of Deuteronomy. As Moses was talking to the children of Israel just before they uh, were to go into the promised land. But we do know that whatever this book of covenant is that's being referred to here, it refers to things that were given to the children of Israel before Sinai, specifically the Passover. And so while it includes a lot of things uh, that we'll read about here in these three chapters, and a lot of people believe this is the content of the Book of the Covenant, I would submit to you that it uh, includes much more than that. It includes all that has been given to the children of Israel up to this point, all that they are supposed to obey, all that they've said that they will keep and all that they've said that they will do up to this point in time, because that is the basis of their covenant relationship with the Lord of heaven. Now, as we start into looking at these various laws, we're not going to look at near all of these laws. We're just going to pick a couple of them out and, and talk about them in terms of what we can learn from them and what benefit they have for us today. And um, this is really where I miss being in the auditorium class and being able to discuss with you all what's going on in this section, because this is a really good section where you could just open it up and ask People, what are some specific things in these laws that either you have questions about or seem um, especially remarkable to you? Because if you spend some time reading through these laws, you'll see that for laws that were written thousands and thousands of years ago, they're very um, mindful of things that we see as important today. Uh, we have many laws today that, in, I would say, are not as sophisticated as some of the laws that are provided here by God. Certainly, by contrast to the other laws that are in the Near East at the time, uh, these laws that are given by God are unique. Um, some of them are similar. Uh, the one I mentioned earlier about the ox uh, goring a man, that's a common law that is mentioned in a number of records of laws from other people in the Middle East. And that would be to be expected because they lived and spent time with um, 
cattle and they used oxen for uh, a variety of things to work in the fields. And so it'd be like us talking about someone having a car accident today. And as common as it is for car accidents today would be as common as it might be for them to have situations where an ox would injure a man uh, because that was their mode of doing work in that day. And so it was common for many places in the Middle East to have laws regarding that. And that's to be expected. The laws that are given to the children of Israel are for their time and their place, their uh, situation in life. And so they will reflect the same kind of things that would be reflected elsewhere in other laws that are given and made by men. Uh, we mentioned a couple weeks ago how that some of those laws could reflect the laws that God had given uh, many generations before. But the uniqueness of the law that's given here, uh, we can see in a variety of things. And this first thing we see is in regards to slavery. Uh, many of the laws in the Near East had rules and guidelines concerning slavery, but they usually were very, very low priority. They were very far down in the list of laws. They weren't something that were emphasized. Um, and then if you look at some of the things I had in the handout, one of the quotes there are specifically from Sarna, one of the commentaries that I refer to says that everywhere the attitude of the slave was marked by ambivalence. He was an item of property to be assessed in terms of monetary value. That's how the laws in the Middle East looked at it. It was the idea of the slave was merely property. And God's laws here are different. Not only is it the first real categorized law that's given after the 10 words, the the real uh, foundation of the moral code, but it is based upon the very experience of the children of Israel in Egypt. You can understand why God would uh, be quick to point out to them that while slavery may be permitted under certain circumstances, it's not going to be the kind of slavery uh, that you were in in Egypt. That's not right. He judged Egypt because of what they had done. And he would judge the children of Israel for uh, abusing their fellow man. And so here we see the laws concerning slavery being the first. And in one of the ways in which these laws are unique from other laws in the region, certainly maybe even up until our day today. I'd encourage you to read some of those comments that I have in the handouts regarding this idea of slavery and um, to think about the laws here that are given just in this one section and are also given in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and some other passages in the Old Testament. But let's look at some examples. Uh, they were to serve six years and then go free. Now, you need to understand that the slavery we're talking about here was not what we typically think about as slavery. These were people that uh, were in servitude, usually because of a debt they had or because they were just in abject poverty and they were willing to serve somebody in order to survive. But the law of the Lord was they were to serve six years and then go free. Sounds like it refers back to the idea of the Sabbath and how that they were to work six days and rest on the seventh. After six years of servitude, they were to be allowed to go free. And if you go over and read in some of the passages and uh, elsewhere in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, the Lord tells the people that if they indeed work for you for six years, you need to be willing to let them go in the way that I tell you to, because they're worth double what a hired servant would be during that time. At the end of the six years, when they were supposed to let them go free, they could remain a slave if they so chose to. And we've read that famous passage from uh, the scriptures that talk about how that uh, if the master shall bring him to the judges and he shall also bring him to the door and to the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, 
and he shall serve him forever. We've read that passage before, and you hear people talking about it from time to time, talking about the voluntary servitude that they could give, and also an example of the voluntary servitude that we're to offer to our Lord and our Master, the God of heaven. If they didn't treat their um, slave fairly, they were to allow them to go free. And we can read that in the 21st chapter in the 11th verse. And if he does not do these three things to her, then she shall go out free without money. Now, people debate about what that's referring to, what three things that is. But the point being is there was established guidelines for how they were to treat people. And if they didn't follow those, then they didn't have the benefit of selling them or they didn't have the benefit of uh, keeping them. They were to allow them to go free. I mentioned earlier that the kind of slavery that we're in general familiar with, such as was here in the United States, uh, is forbidden actually in the scriptures. Kidnapping, stealing a human was punishable by death. And if you look at the passages here that are in the 21st chapter, specifically 21 and verse 16. And he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So a free man taken from his freedom and made to serve the person that did that or the person that owned or was keeping that person in slavery or is to be put to death. Um, that doesn't sound like the kind of slavery that we had in the United States, because that indeed was what happened, is they would kidnap people and force them into servitude. And not only servitude for six years, but servitude for life. And servitude intergenerational, from one generation to another, the people would remain in slavery. That was not what God uh, intended for his people to do. It was maybe what occurred in the world at the time, such as we see the children of Israel serving with rigor in hard bondage in um, Egypt. But that was not what he wanted his people to do. And so that's why these rules and regulations were there. And that's what makes these unique from the other list of rules that can be found in other uh, Near Eastern um, ancient manuscripts. The master would be punished if the slave was abused to death. And a lot of people get concerned about that because it doesn't say he will be put to death. And again, we got to look at the time and the place and what was going on there and the custom and what God wanted from his people and yet what he permitted with them. If a slave was wounded by his master, he would be set free for so much even as a him losing a tooth. Again, I said earlier, that's we can't relate to some of this stuff because you and I lose a tooth and we have the expectation that we can go to a dentist and have it repaired. And, but at that time and at that place, they didn't have that kind of a benefit. So if a man lost an eye or lost a tooth, it was a significant loss for them. And if they were one of their servants, one of their slaves, and because they had done that to them, they were to let them go free. So again, this stands in stark contrast to uh, what we could read about and what we can know about happened here in the United States at the time of slavery here. And so we just need to keep that in mind, that this was a different time and a different place but God's laws were unique and were different and were um, there so the children of Israel would know what it is that they were supposed to do and they would be different than the nations around about them and that they would do what God wanted them to do and how they treated each other and how they behaved towards each other and how they behaved towards God. I've listed there Leviticus, the 25th chapter and several verses, but I do want to read from Leviticus uh, 25 and verse 55, because at the end of the teaching there in Leviticus about slaves and how they're to treat slaves, how they're to take strangers as slaves and do those kinds of things, notice what he says to the people of Israel. For unto me the children of Israel are servants, 
They are my servants, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. The narrative that we see here, what is told to us here in these laws, is included with the story of the children of Israel being redeemed from Egypt, of coming out from slavery. And so how they are to treat people that are in servitude is driven by how the Lord wants them to treat them, but also their memory collectively of the things which was done to them in Egypt. They're God's slaves. They're God's servants. He expects that of them because he brought them out of servitude. And the very fact that he brought them out of that servitude is where he begins in the giving of the Ten Commandments and where he bases the laws that we read about here in the Book of the Covenant and specifically the laws regarding slavery. Another law that's interesting for us to think about and consider are the rules, the regulations, the laws, the statutes, the commandments regarding restitution, as we might call it. Now, in Exodus 21st chapter, in verses 18 and 19, we read an example. And if men strive together, and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Think about that. Here is two individuals who get in a ruckus, who fight, who strive, who because of the action of one, the other is injured. So the man is not going to be punished as it were for injuring the other man. If he's able to rise again and to walk abroad upon his staff, in other words, if he heals well enough that he can go about uh, walking, there's not going to be punishment, but there will be restitution because he says he shall pay for the loss of his time and cause him to be thoroughly healed. That's a pretty um, modern concept if we were to think about it. Uh, it's a concept where if I do something because of either positive action or inaction on my part and causes you to be hurt, I need to compensate you. I need to give you restitution for that which you have lost because I allowed you or caused you to be injured. That was part of the base law here. And I would submit to you that as we think about that in today's society, oftentimes the way in which we can achieve that restitution is through a prolonged civil uh, battle, a prolonged civil uh, lawsuit. Uh, it's not something that's handed out necessarily by the judge when the judge finds the individual guilty of what they've done. And we can see that in regards to the ox here. And we can see a whole host of things in regards to this section in verses 28 through 36 about the ox that gores a man. Notice, the ox that gores a man should be stoned. The ox is to be put to death. And if the owner of the ox uh, owns this ox that has been known to do this in the past, especially if someone has been put to death, uh, and someone has been injured or died as a result of his ox being contrary, being difficult, being hard to handle, then the owner could be put to death or he could be redeemed with a ransom. You see compensation in this section if uh, a slave is injured. You see compensation if someone digs a pit and another person's ox falls in the pit. He's to as the King James says, make it good. He's to make the other man whole. And we see that in regards to if one ox gores another ox, the man who has the ox that did the goring needs to give his ox to the man who lost an ox. 
uh, or if he be in verse 36 or if he be known that the ox hath used to push in time past and his owner hath not kept him in he shall surely pay ox for ox and the dead shall be his own so in other words uh, it, it has a way in which to talk about how you divide the surviving ox when you kill the ox that gores when you uh, give your ox to somebody else because it has caused problems for them who even gets the dead ox and how it's divided you see there's really a lot here if we'll spend some time thinking about it you say now why in the world would i want to spend time thinking about an ox well let's think about some ways in which this might apply to us today for instance, we said earlier, it might be like a car or a truck that you have. If you had a car that had bad brakes and you knew they had bad brakes and yet you loaned it to somebody to use and they got in a crash because it had bad brakes and it could be proven that you uh, didn't have that car repaired or didn't take care of it, well, then you could be liable for that. What about... Hmm, we see drones today. We expect to see more and more robots in the future. What if your robot or your drone that's under your control causes harm to somebody else? How should you be liable? What if you wrote a computer program or an app and by way of that computer program or that app, somebody is injured or someone loses money or someone takes the wrong medicine? or in some way has a loss, how should you compensate them? How should the law look at that situation? Thousands of years ago, God gave the children of Israel laws, which in many ways address the same kinds of things we find today. And one of them was this idea of restitution, making it good, uh, making sure the man is thoroughly healed, uh, paying for lost time, those kinds of things. Here's some of the things that's unique about God's laws that's given here in this book of the covenant. Notice the focus on the individual. Uh, it's talking about individuals here and their interaction between them. Notice the focus on the rights of the individual. Um, I need to be made whole. I need to have my wages paid for, my time paid for. Uh, I lost my ox, I need to get another ox. Notice the focus on personal property. The ox didn't belong to the village. It didn't belong to all the children of Israel. While there are aspects of what they are to do and talk about in the future that there is things common among them, there is a very keen focus on personal property and these laws that God gives. And above all, there was a focus on individual responsibility. We live increasingly in a time when people aren't at fault for what they do, or people don't want to be at fault for what they do, when people don't tend to be responsible for what it is that they have done that impacts somebody else, that harms the property of somebody else that causes somebody else injury. The laws of God thousands of years ago as they were given to the children of Israel, even though in a different place in a different time, talking about oxes instead of the things that are common among us are nevertheless laws that focus on things that God wants his people to focus on and focuses upon God's people treating each other in a way that's acceptable to him. Now, I said that they lived in a different time in a different place. Think about the children of Israel. They're a few months out of Egypt. They've lived probably, if not all their life, most all their life, if not the life of their ancestors in bondage. We don't know exactly when they went into bondage in Egypt, but they'd been there a long time in bondage. And so they'd gone from being slaves, making brick, making brick without straw, serving with rigor in hard bondage in Egypt. And now they're given these laws. 
Now we look sometimes at these laws and think how restrictive they are, how, how they're just a list of rules that we have to follow. Imagine how liberating this law was for the children of Israel. For a slave that never had anything, who his very life and his existence was at the mercy of cruel masters, to now have a law that protected his personal property, gave him a recourse if someone took something from him, gave him a recourse if something accidentally happened to him. It did hold him responsible for what he might do wrong, but it also held each and every one of them to a standard that they all knew that they could go before the judge, they could go before even the Lord, as we'll see later on, and plead their cause, knowing that there was a law that was for all of them and applicable to all of them. As I said, we're not going to go through this list of laws. I'd encourage you to read through it and think about the things we've said here and think about the uniqueness of these laws, think about how these laws might inform us of what God wants. Compare these laws as we did with the Ten Commandments with what we find in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. Laws which we uh, should be mindful of. And realize that while some of these laws were very specific to the children of Israel, were very specific in time, um, they also included laws which would govern them when they got into the land. Laws which governed them all the way to the time of Josiah, as we read a little earlier when we read from 2 Kings. But notice another aspect of the law here as we look at this example from the 22nd chapter, beginning in verse 21. Notice how this moral law and their expected conduct was grounded in their history. You shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not afflict any widow or orphan if you afflict him at all. And if he does cry out to me, I will surely hear his cry and my anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. We see here a couple aspects that make the law that God gave the children of Israel unique among the laws that were in the near or Middle East at that time. Here we see a law that comes directly from God. It's a law that not only comes from God, but the punishment for the law will be given by God. We read earlier that the ox that uh, had gored a man and he dies, it should be stoned to death. There was a punishment. We read about how an ox and uh, should be taken and given to the man uh, that lost the ox. We, we read examples of that throughout this section of how uh, what is to be done if someone violates a law or what the punishment is for violating a law. Here we see the punishment is going to be brought by God. And he emphasizes to them, treat others in a way you would have wanted to be treated when you were a stranger in the land of Egypt. Sound a little bit like what we talk about in the New Testament as the golden rule? Sound a little bit about like treating others as you want to be treated? That's what he's talking about here. Don't wrong or oppress a stranger because you were a stranger in the land of Egypt. Don't afflict a widow or an orphan, because if you do, I will make your wife a widow and your children fatherless. That'll be the judgment brought upon you. I want you to note the quote that I had a, uh, probably a week ago, I believe, when we had the section on uh, the Ten Commandments. And again, it was another quote from Sarna, from that commentary. And I'm just going to read it to you. It says, The Decalogue and its contents are, however, in a class by themselves. The idea of a conventional relationship between God and entire people is unparalleled. 
Similarly, unique is the setting of the covenant in a narrative context. It is the latter that imparts to the covenant its meaning and significance. The covenant would be devalued were the link between them severed. What he's saying there is this idea that these rules, uh, these regulations, these laws, these judgments are grounded in their history, are grounded in their experience, come from God, and not just something that was handed down to them, but something that was handed down to them after he had delivered them out of bondage, after he had led them to Sinai. All of that, all that that goes on in the narrative makes these laws unique among the other laws we can read about from that time and puts real power behind the fact that these are the laws of God. These are the testimony, the commandments of the Lord and something they were to follow and something they were to do. Notice the promise here. We've talked before about promises. Notice the promise here. I will punish you. I will surely hear his cry. What cry? The same cry that you gave when you were being mistreated as children of Israel and Egypt. I will hear his cry. My anger will be kindled and I will kill you with the sword. In other words, you're going to receive the punishment, not from another man directly, but from me working through other men, I will cause it to happen. And that's a powerful lesson for us and something for us to think about because this shows us the importance to God of this moral code, of this law that he's given to the children of Israel. Once you look at the contrast of this idea of the book of the covenant with the final two verses of this section. In chapter uh, 23, beginning in verse 32, we read, Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto you. He's talking about at the end of uh, chapter 23, he gives a promise that he will help them uh, occupy the land of promise. And he'll do that by driving out the inhabitants of the land. And he talks about how he'll do it little by little uh, so that the land can be utilized by the children of Israel as they go into it. We talked and we studied the book of Deuteronomy how that they were promised vineyards that they had not planted and orchards which they had not planted that they would reap the benefits of it. So God says he will drive them out. And he says what he will set as the bounds for the children of Israel. But he tells them very clearly, I'm making a covenant with you, but you'll not make a covenant with them, nor with their gods. You're not going to enter into the kind of relationship I have with you with anybody else, and certainly not with any man imagined God, a man-made God, some God who has no power because he doesn't exist, you're not to enter into a covenant with them or any other God. Think about the contrast of this with what happened in Josiah's day. Think about hearing these words read if you were Josiah. And understand what the children of Israel at that time had done that had been wrong. God says you're not to make any covenant with them. Your covenant is to be with me. And they're not to dwell in thy land. You're supposed to push them out. Lest they make thee sin against me. What exactly ended up happening when they intermarried with the children of the land or they failed to drive them out? And he says, for if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. Think of the first of the Ten Commandments. What he says there in that passage that we're familiar with. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's what they were 
given here, a covenant. And we'll talk about that perhaps next week when we get into chapter 24. A covenant with the Lord God of heaven, their creator, the one who had delivered them, the one who had redeemed them. And they were not entering into the same type of covenant with anybody else because he was their master. He was their Lord. They were his children. They were his people. They were his servants. Remember last week when we talked about chapters 19 and 20, we talked about this passage. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom priest and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak to the children of Israel. They were given the words, as we talked about the ten words in chapter 20. Now they're given the judgments. They're given that which they are to follow, that which helps them understand the law which God has given to them that which un helps them to understand what they are to do. It's a covenant and a promise that goes with that covenant. And with this covenant are obligations, expectations, what they are to keep. We need to think about that. We need to think about the passage of 1 Peter 2 and 9 because there Peter puts these same thoughts on us in regards to being a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. We need to think about that and to think about what they needed to do to be pleasing to God, to keep his covenant, to receive his mercy, to be in a covenant relationship with him. And then we need to use that to help inform us and help us think about what we need to do, what we need to be focused on, what we need to keep, under the new covenant that God has established through his son in the New Testament. Because we're just as much in a covenant relationship with God today as they were. It's a different co covenant, a different list of rules and regulations. Some are the same. Many are very different. But nevertheless, it is a covenant between God and his people, between the creator of the universe, between our Lord our master, and us. And we need to be thoughtful about that covenant, thoughtful about the rules and regulations that he has given to us. And we need to meditate upon those things and be focused on them if we're to be pleasing to God. That ends our study for today. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I encourage you to go about this week and read chapters 24 through 31. We have a pretty sizable section to talk about. We're going to talk about being sanctified. We're going to talk about what's in this section. And again, as we've tried to each week, apply some of these things to us as we live our life here under the New Testament. Thank you for your time. May God bless you.